So, um, you know a bit about different kinds of statistics to use. What I want to do now is talk about a couple of the dangers that can come, that are creeping there along the way for you. Not wanting to scare you, more just to, to warn you and uh, a bit like a road, we're going to give you some hazard signs, but the reason for that is to help you to drive more safely. Um, so first of all I want to talk about um, interrelated factors. That sounds a weird thing to say, um, but uh, I'm going to give you some dietary examples first of all. I should have brought in some packs of butter and stuff with me and I forgot, but, um, but I'll talk about diet, dietary examples just because that's a common thing and then also then see how that works in the, the UI term. So the first thing is what I'm going to call non-independent factors. We talked a lot about independence in previous videos. Um, the example I've got here is to give you an idea what this is, is sometimes you've got multiple things that are often um, you're measuring in some way um, but are not independent of each other. So as in when one changes something has to happen to the other. So fat and sugar in diet are a good example of this. If you cut fat out of your diet it's a good chance you'll end up having a lot of sugars uh, because otherwise you starve. And similarly if you cut sugars out of your diet it's likely you have a lot of fat. So if you um, look at statistics and you just measure the amount of fat in somebody's diet um, that actually might be, uh, and you perhaps saw that fat was good, that might be just because they're having less sugar and the sugar and that was um, the reason or vice versa. Um, now how that might turn out, I mean you can see that can come in various ways but in a user interface um, uh, example one of the ways that plays out is when you try and take a system and take a property away from it. So you might say, oh we've got this system and we believe that consistency is important so let's try and make it more consistent or maybe if you're a sort of a, the scientist who likes breaking things you might want to make it less consistent. You know how do you have the same interface but make it more or less consistent? Usually as you make that change you have to change something else as well and so you think you're measuring changing the consistency of the interface but actually you're changing it might be the other fact you have to change just like you change the fat in the diet and the sugar changes. Um, so now that doesn't mean you can't do the experiment but you need to um, understand that and try and disentangle these but in the end you usually can't completely disentangle them so you have to use some of your reasoning some of the understanding of mechanism we taught that um, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about in the later videos uh, in order to be able to, to make sense of this. Um, a similar thing, but it's slightly different, are when you have correlated features. So things that are usually they're your independent variables, the things that you're trying to, um, actually it works both ways around, but you're trying to change in order to influence something. Um, and you think that you've found some factors. So for instance, you may decide that people who are lighter and more heavier, oh sorry, no, you would find people lighter, more, people who are lighter are more, are more fit. Um, but that could be that people who are a bit overweight tend not to do as much exercise and therefore are less fit. So is it because they're overweight that they're less fit or is it because they do less exercise? and they're likely to be uh, interrelated. Um, classic example of this might be say age and job seniority. So you go to a company, you measure, you know, you've got your interface, you try it out and you find that one interface doesn't work so well with senior managers and it works better with junior staff. Um, and then you look at it and you discover the one that doesn't do so well with senior managers has smaller font in it. Uh, um, but of course senior managers tend to be older and with age uh, as I have found um, often your eyesight degenerates somewhat and therefore visually you might not be able to uh, see things as well. So age and job seniority are correlated with one another. If both are varying, if they're not varying independently, which usually they're not, you might think something's causally related to seniority and actually it's related to age. Another, well, when I say another thing, another the whole pack of things to be careful of is cherry picking. Um, so cherry picking is when you, you go there and you're after some results and you basically poke around until you find what you're interested in. Now sometimes, I mean that's not bad, sometimes you'll have to work to find things, I don't mean don't do the work, but be very careful that by doing that um, you're not 
really just pushing your belief into the data. Um, one way this occurs is through multiple tests. When you uh, take lots and lots of things and try them all out, and then one of them comes up significant and you say, yay, and then you tell everybody about that one. Um, classic thing, you see it a lot. So um, you might get that through just doing lots of work, but a classic way this occurs, say you've done a survey with 40 questions, and then you check each question to see whether there's any difference between your new wonderful interface and the one that was there before. Um, and sure enough, you find one question that looks good, you do your stats on it, it comes out 5% significant. Yay! You tell everybody, isn't this wonderful because it's come out better there. Of course, remember, your 5% significance means that it's by random chance you'd see it one time in 20. If you have 40 questions, actually, you typically, on average, expect to see two of those come up 5% significance, even if there's nothing there. All right? So actually, if you're doing 40 questions and um, you're looking really 5% is what you decide is your nice value, why you would, another question, you actually have to look for 5 divided by 40, 0.0. 0.125% significance. Um, really, you know, one of those has to be really, really way out there before you can start thinking you've got something. Even worse, and again, incredibly easy to do, is you look at those questions and you decide, actually, what's interesting isn't so much the actual value of them as their correlation, the way they interrelate with one another. So you've got 40 different things and then you look for the correlations between them. So if you've got 40 things, each one's got 40 things it can correlate with. You double count because you measure both ways around, but you end up with, if I've got the sums in my head, right, 780, I think, comparisons. With 780 comparisons, one in 20 of those, by random chance, would be likely to come out with a 5% significance. So one in 20 of 780 is... It's a hundred and... no, I'm not doing this wrong. It's... ah, I can't do any sums. Anyway, it's a lot. Um, I'll try and get that right in the notes. Anybody who can do their sums quick, divide 20s into 780. Um, it's about... oh no, done. I should be able to do the arith mental arithmetic. I'm a mathematician, but never mind. Um, Actually, it was a joke my uh, wife told me once was there's three times types of mathematician. There's those who can add up and those who can't. Okay, leave that one with you. Um, so another kind of cherry picking you get is sometimes choosing different tests. So you get your stats and you, you do a non-parametric test of some sort and you do a t-test and you do another test until one of them comes out significant. And then you don't tell anybody about all the tests that you didn't do. Right. Even worse now, um, you might do some traditional tests, some t-testing, and you might try a Bayesian test as well. I saw this recently in a paper. Um, the paper had lots of different things it was doing. Everything, it used traditional p-value testing, p less than this, p less than that, lots of those. And in the middle, there was one Bayesian test. There was no explanation about why. Um, they just did the Bayesian test and it came out um, with a, an odds ratio that made it uh, good evidence by um, Bayesian testing standards. Um, I mean, it could be there was some reason, there was no explanation. My guess is this particular thing didn't come out right with their, uh, when they did their uh, t-tests or whatever the tests would have otherwise have been. They then tried a Bayesian test, the Bayesian test came out and they stuck with it. Um, because if you each, if you keep throwing tests at something, sooner or later you'll find something. Um, you're not, you're not really, you have any confidence that actually that means anything. Um, two last, what two other things I'll talk about under this heading. Um, one is about outliers. So outliers are data values that are sort of just seem very big or very small or in some way very extreme. Um, one problem with outliers is that they can pull something like an average way out. So you have so you um, something like the Wayne Rooney examples uh, as um, a, you know Wayne Rooney's uh, wage bill suddenly can actually if you if um, if you had a group of twenty people in the UK and one of them happens to be Wayne Rooney and you look at their average wage, it will not look very sensible. Um, 
So often what people do is, there's different ways of doing it, but they actually just remove the outlet. They say, well, clearly there's something wrong with that. It might be a mistake in your experiment, or it might just be a very extreme value. What we're going to do is just remove it. The danger with doing that is if you're not careful, right, you might remove outliers until you get the result you want. So if you're removing outliers, you have to be very careful that you've got a good rationale for why you're doing it. Ideally, you'd decide that up front before you ever get your data. So you, some people say things like everything that's more than two standard deviations from the average value, we're going to remove as an outlier or something like that. So they have a rule that they start with. Um, Sometimes you can't do that for whatever reason, but certainly you have to be incredibly careful that you're not doing it in order to get your result. Do it blind to its impact. Do it because it looks a bad value, not because when you remove it, you get the result you want. And don't do that by accident. In general too, the other thing, which is both something you have to do sometimes, but it's a dangerous thing, is you look at your data, you visualise it, you get all this stuff up, and you think, ah, I can see something there. You then do a test for that thing. And sure enough, it comes out statistically significant. If you can see it, it probably is going to come out statistically, I can say, statistically significant. Um, but of course, there are many, many things you could have seen. And so effectively, you're, when you do that visualisation, seeing a pattern jump out and then testing it, it's like all the possible uh, patterns you could have ever seen. We'll see, um, actually, in the next video, an uh, example of, of um, that working out in practice, how, or at least a situation where you can see how that could come out. Um, so again, the, p the purpose of talking about some of these dangers is not to scare you, but to warn you of things too, of pitfalls that you might um, face on the way.